talk about USDA conservation programs and practices. I noticed when we did the initial poll to get to know the audience that over half of you responded that you were um, a conservation planner or had another staff position with NRCS. So this will be familiar to you. It's just an introduction. Um, for those that are unfamiliar with the uh, USDA NRCS, that's an agency. NRCS stands for Natural Resources Conservation Service. It's an agency within the USDA, the Department of Agriculture. It got its start as the Soil Conservation Service back in the day of the uh, Dust Bowl to conserve, um, you know, the main work they were doing was to conserve soil and moisture on working lands. And it evolved over time to looking at other resource concerns, which we'll talk about today. So in the early 90s, uh, the name changed to Natural Resources Conservation Service to kind of reflect this broadened scope, uh, scope of conservation. And we'll look at these, the way this is organized, we're gonna talk about some of the programs. So these are federal programs um, administered by the USDA or some of our sister agencies. And then we'll whittle it down and talk about specific practices under those programs for soil invertebrates. Um, we're not going to be able to cover all of them because there's a lot. So I hope this just gives you a sampling of some of those practices that are um, going to be beneficial to conserve and protect the soil invertebrates that we've been talking about today. So NRCS programs and practices address specific natural resource concerns. Two of these that are especially relevant for beneficial soil invertebrates are soil organism habitat loss or degradation. So the objective to address that resource concern would be to improve habitat, right? Pretty straightforward. Terrestrial habitat for wildlife and invertebrates. Again, the objective is to improve the quantity and quality of habitat to meet the requirements of those terrestrial wildlife species. And as we've been saying today, you know, these soil organisms, invertebrates and insects are animals. So they do fall under wildlife, although sometimes not as well recognized as some of our big charismatic megafauna. So three cheers for the columbula and all of the other tiny um, but very instrumental animals in our soil that often get overlooked. So the programs that we're gonna talk about are largely funded by farm bill dollars um, and USDA NRCS, so the Natural Resources Conservation Service, I'm gonna say NRCS from now on, provides technical and financial assistance for these farm bill programs. This funding comes from taxpayer dollars. And so there are a lot of different programs and they, and they work differently. And um, there are some requirements you have to meet to be involved in these. And that's because we wanna spend those taxpayer dollars um, really making big change on the landscape, right? So one of the things NRCS does is provide what we call uh, conservation technical assistance or CTA. You'll learn there's a lot of acronyms in the um, NRCS world. So I've put those in here. And what that is, is just one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one advice and information based on science and research. So if you are a farmer or a rancher or a private forest landowner or the general public and you have questions on conservation issues, um, you can contact us. We can point you to lots of resources. We can answer questions to the best of our ability, along with conservation planners and soil conservationists. NRCS in each state has specialists on staff, and so they might be able to point you to somebody with specific knowledge in that area. And this is to help producers make informed decisions, to share resources and tools, right? These are publicly available. We also have programs that offer financial assistance. So this is for implementing practices that address those natural resource concerns. So we have to come out um, and actually do assessments on the land and verify that yes, you do have a concern uh, for habitat for terrestrial wildlife, or you do have a soil health concern or a water quality concern. There's a lot of other um, resource concerns beyond what we're talking about today that fall under wildlife. 
And if you implement practices to address those concerns and you become eligible for funding and you have a contract, you could get paid um, a flat rate, a certain amount for implementing those. So what this is, is incentive to cut down on the cost to make our landscapes and our working lands um, more sustainable and have them enter into these conservation uh, practices. So for, those, for that financial assistance, again, you must meet eligibility requirements and you must be addressing a natural resource concern on your land. And those natural resources concerns, we use the acronym SWAPA plus E. And what that stands for is soil, water, animals, plants, and energy, right? We've recently added energy to the, um, to the list of resource concerns. And if you're working with us, with the Xerces Society, we have partner biologists um, throughout the country that work directly with an RCS in a partner position providing technical assistance. So you may be, you know, you may talk to somebody at your local NRCS office and ask about soil invertebrates, but the person you're talking to may not know as much as some people that are entomologists or have been studying this or specialize in that area. So what our role is there is to kind of increase the capacity for these planners and help them understand, you know, what needs to be done to address specific um, resource concerns. So in that way, our partner positions are kind of acting as a specialist. Um, we also provide technical assistance with pest management conservation systems, which you can imagine from what Stephanie uh, was talking about earlier about the impacts of pesticides. So reducing those impacts is very important as well. And some of the um, you know, most common programs, this is not all of them, but I'm going to introduce some of the most common programs that within those programs have practices that address soil health resource concerns and also animal resource concerns. So that combination of both healthy soils and healthy soil life. Right? So EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, again, addresses natural resource concerns. These can include, but are not limited to, limited to soil health, improving soil quality on agricultural lands, improving habitat for wildlife and invertebrates, including beneficial insects, and also crop-based or field management practices that can protect soil invertebrates. Um, examples are, are things like reduced tillage, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Under the EQIP program, there's also an organic initiative, and NRCS provides assistance here to help organic producers, existing certified organic producers, um, to improve their operation and meet national organic uh, practice standards. We can also help interested producers that are not currently um, USDA organic certified to transition to that, right? So this can be the development of a plan tailored to their needs. And that can be what we call conservation activity plans or specific plans for certain practices that can help transit that farm transition to organic and also can be part of the organic systems plan. Another program is the conservation stewardship program. This rewards producers that are already implementing good stewardship practices, but um, you get an annual payment, but you're also expected to continue those good practices and add on more what they call enhancements. And these enhancements, um, there's a lot of them, and there a lot of them are analogous to equip practices. So they'll use the same practice standards, but the program is set up a little differently. And then we have the Conservation Reserve Program. And this is administered by our sister agency, the Farm Service Agency but NRCS still provides the technical uh, end of the technical assistance for this program. So you would have to go to FSA to do paperwork, 
um, and eligibility requirements and all that for uh, the conservation reserve program. But you work, we work with FSA and our CS employees do to provide that technical assistance. And this is a program where you're retiring land that's in production um, in environmentally sensitive areas. So highly erodible areas in areas like the Chesapeake Bay watershed where we have water quality issues. Um, and this is a larger commitment. So you are agreeing to set aside that land, stop crop production and grow permanent cover um, or create buffers along waterways that um, you know, end up being a 10 to 15 year commitment. All right. So to learn more about these programs, I'm a biologist, you know, as Stephanie introduced me earlier, I work on pollinators and beneficial insects. I am not a programs expert, but you can contact your local field office and get all those answers about the paperwork, the process, eligibility, um, where to get started, who to talk to. And you can do that online through, um, if you just Google contact NRCS, it will come up with a map and you could select your location for your local field office. Now I'm gonna talk about some practices. Um, all of these, well, not all of these, but the, what I will showcase today are taken from our Farming with Soil Life Handbook. So that's what this course says, just as a reminder, is based on. And if you look at pages 117 to 123, you'll find a table that lists um, several over 30 or an overview of 30 35, excuse me, NRCS practices that support beneficial soil organisms. That doesn't mean it's all inclusive, but these are very commonly implemented practices. Um, and for more information on these practices, you can also visit NRCS Soil Health webpage. Um, there's also a lot of resources on those pages as far as information, fact sheets, and so on. So using that in tandem with this Farming for Soil Life um, book will give you a really broad overview of these practices and whittle down to some specifics here. Like you see in the last column here, that provides a, a little description of each practice. Again, just a reminder, you know, these are based on um, uh, these, what we are calling resource concerns or what NRCS calls resource concerns, and they're defined by the agency. So we're going to be looking at soil organism habitat loss or degradation and terrestrial habitat today. But there are other resource concerns um, that these programs and practices help to address. So as you can imagine, um, practices like cover crop, which is available um, through EQIP and through different CSP enhancements um, is really vital, right? So what NRCS likes to use is the little rhyme, discover the cover. Keeping that soil covered when it's not in crop production is critical. And this can be grass or grains, small grain species like you see in this picture here or it could be flowering species or a, a multi-species mix. Um, what this does is it covers the soil, prevents erosion, it helps to smother weeds, it helps retain moisture and build soil, right? Um, the use of flowering cover crops has another layer of benefits because it provides forage for these beneficial insects and pollinators. Now, pollinators is probably obvious, but a lot of the beneficial insects we talked about, for example, hoverflies, um, you know, in that larval stage, they're predators, but in the adult stage, they need flower nectar, right? They switch their diets. So having the best of both worlds here, providing that short-term foraging habitat where they can, where insects can access nectar and pollen resources along with that cover is critical. And here are some examples here, going left to right, you see buckwheat, sunflower, and then you see a cool season mix of grasses and uh, vetch. A couple other flowering cover crops, you know, you'll recognize these crimson clover, other clovers are brassica species. Um, partridge pea is a, a perennial or short-term, short-lived legume that we often put in pollinator mixes but it's fairly cheap seed and it's a very high quality resource for uh, bees and beneficial insects. 
So the key here is not just planting these, but allowing them to flower before they're terminated, right? or a percentage of them to flower. Um, here's a case study, just oh, again, emphasizing the multiple benefits of cover crops. Um, in this study, when flowering cover crops like buckwheat, like you see in this picture here, were planted near soybean crops, that increased uh, wasp parasitism. So these beneficial parasitic wasps that attack pest insects, um, it increased wasp parasitism of stink bug eggs. This particular wasp parasitizes the egg stage of stink bugs by two and a half times. So that's pretty significant. And here you can see that little teeny tiny microscopic wasp injecting an egg into the, um, or injecting its egg into the egg of a, of a stink bug. And what that wasp will do inside that egg is develop and break out as an adult um, after it goes through metamorphosis. And then it will eventually kill that pest, right? So fewer pests, fewer stink bugs in the Northeast. I think people will give three cheers for that. Here's another key study. This is a more novel cover cropping approach. We call these insectary plantings. We really beef them up with um, annual flowers and sometimes perennial flowers, depending on the system, that um, provide a burst of that nectar and pollen resources. But a lot of them also have uh, extra floral nectaries, which is a source of nectar on the plant that is especially important during drought um, conditions because the actual flower parts will be more conservative with nectar recharge but we seem to be able to um, hold these insects over with nectar from those extra floral nectaries. They're very important. Um, this is a vineyard and apple orchard. They were establishing, it was a perfect situation here in New Hampshire. They were establishing um, new vines and planting new apple trees. And so as they were doing that, they seeded this ground cover with bachelor button, and other insectary plants, um, buckwheat uh, was one of them as well. So you see you have that flowering row cover and it's very beautiful as well. Conservation crop rotation, so rotating those crops, adding diversity, planting more different kinds of crops is always good. You know, we're always looking at increasing farmland diversity and biodiversity. This also can give rest to the soil. So in a crop rotation, a cover crop can be considered a crop. Also breaks pest diseases in the soil, right? That, that should be common knowledge to most people moving around crops instead of planting them in the same location over and over reduces that uh, potential for disease because it breaks the disease cycle. So here's a case study from New York. This is Roxbury Farm. Um, you can actually find this um, in the publication linked below. There's this case study and more, but you can see here the different types of crop fields across this farm. And they were planting a four or five year rotation, which included um, cover crops for green manures, fallow, variety of vegetables where we, they were um, rotating the families of vegetables in different fields to break that crop cycle. So there was, in this case, broccoli, there was sweet corn, and then they used clover cover crops. Um, and in other parts of the farm, they have hayland and then they rest fields as well. So a five-year rotation here, and this map just shows the layout of that. Um, and you can find more information on that in the crop rotation publication. Residue management. Um, so reduced tillage or no-till. Again, practices available under EQIP and CSP. Um, and this also helps to increase soil organic matter, as you can imagine. So frequent tillage destroys soil structure and disrupts soil life. That should be common knowledge, pretty straightforward. Adopting conservation tillage helps with erosion, erosion control, right? You can also rotate areas being tilled. Um, not tilling 
Field borders or fence rows can be key. A lot of times you'll hear the saying, the best soil is along the fence row. Using no-till planting and cover crop termination strategies and so on, right? Planting that permanent vegetation, again, is, is key. So one way to reduce the impact of cover crop termination is to use um, this here, instead of tilling that cover crop in and incorporating it into the soil, you can use a roller crimper, which just rolls over the plants, breaks the stems and lays them down, and you can plant into that residue. And here's an example of that. This is Campbell Farms in Pennsylvania. They have a 2000 acre diversified farm. This is a conventional farm. Um, and on that, they plant 400 acres of pumpkins, which is one of their biggest um, cash crops on the farm. This particular farmer uh, participated with um, the Xerce Society staff that were part of a project called Project Integrated Pollination, or ICP. And what they did was they planted a Ryan vetch mix. Um, their goal here was to support pollinators they recognize um, those soil dwelling pollinators that Jennifer was talking about earlier, in particular ones that specialize on squash plants um, and that their tillage practices could be um, harming their nests. So they wanted to reduce tillage to support that nesting structure and protect those nests. But also they provided um, you know, flowers with the vetch for early season pollinators like bumblebees. And they just uh, roller crimpered that um, cover crop down and planted the pumpkin plants directly into it, leaving that residue as a, as a ground cover. And so here's the before and after from that. Before um, they were using cover crops and conservation tillage practices, they brought in bees, even though they were likely having populations of wild bees, bumblebees and squash bees and others that are really important um, pumpkin pollinators, their practices weren't conducive to the life cycle and the conservation of those species. So they were renting honey beehives at about $135 an acre. So one hive per acre times 400 acres. If you do the math there, you can see that's a pretty substantial cost for pollination. After implementing these practices, they noticed increases in wild bee activity across their, most of their fields, and they were able to cut back on the number of rented honey beehives um, by half. So that's a pretty big savings, right? So these practices benefit a diversity of wild bees, again, many of them, which are ground nesting bees. Um, so they are soil invertebrates and also very important crop pollinators. Conservation cover is another practice um, under EQIP, and there's also CSP enhancements for conservation cover. And essentially, this is just planting areas to permanent vegetation. And there's a wide variety of um, what that is and how that is defined. So there's different what they call scenarios under these practices. And one scenario could be for lower diversity grassland plantings. Right, so it could be introduced grass, like you see here, oops, on um, the picture on the left, or it could be something like um, warm season native grasses, like you see here on the right. And I realize here this pasture grass planting has um, also some, some legumes in it. You could see clover and vetch and other flowers. Mm -hmm. It could also be for permanent cover and perennial cropping systems. So alleyways in orchards, vineyards, and berry crops, right? So here you see an apple orchard. This is very typical to see those middle rows planted to grass. We have a, a case study here from a hops farm in New Jersey that was really struggling with ground cover in their hops field. Um, just an overview of the farm, it's organically managed. They don't use any pesticides, no herbicides, anything. Um, it's in the south part of New Jersey. So they have very dry, droughty, extremely well-drained sandy soils. So challenging conditions. 
They used frequent tillage to manage weeds in the alleys. They essentially kept them fallow in a, in a tillage fallow, cultivated fallow. Um, and they have had lots of um, pressure from aphid and Japanese beetle pests. And if you think of Japanese beetle being a scarab beetle, their larva is you know, a soil dwelling pest invertebrate, right? Um, so their goals were to build soil, reduce erosion, increase water efficiency, attract beneficial insects for those particular pests, and just contribute overall to sustainable um, climate smart farming practices. So this is what the fields looked like before. This was in May 2019. You can see very dry, no cover. Um, here's the, the trellises for the hops plants. Um, we worked with these producers to come up with an alleyway cover mix that would um, be well suited for their conditions. So, you know, there's a lot of different mixes out there, but they don't work if they don't grow. Um, and also their farming goals. So they wanted something low growing, something low mow, low maintenance, drought resistant, something that tolerates traffic so they could get in there and, you know, manage their crops and also provide cover for beneficial insects. So in spring 2020, we seeded, uh, you know, we took a, a good look at um, species that would thrive in these conditions that would be, that would meet those criteria listed above. And in spring 2020, we seeded with a mix of hard fescue, perennial ryegrass, and lady no clover. Again, a little nectar source for those beneficials and that cover in those alleyways. And this is what it looked like as that cover crop filled in. So you can see this lush, healthy system. They immediately recognized that there were more ground beetles, more lady beetles. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get out, the far, out to the farm last year with um, you know, the pandemic restrictions to get good pictures of some of these insects that they were seeing that they hadn't seen before, or at least hadn't seen in abundance. Okay, and there's another picture there, much better. Their irrigation became more efficient and they're seeing lots of benefits. Wildlife habitat planting practice 420 is another um, uh, practice that targets wildlife. It's, it's built for wildlife conservation. Again, the establishment of perennial plant cover. This can be herbaceous, um, shrubs, you know, smaller woody plants, trees are not allowed. There's a different practice for that. But there are a lot of options to increase diversity of, of areas that are not in production where you want to provide habitat. Um, so things like these buffer plantings, riparian plantings, right? Very important. We do a lot of these under the um, CREP, under CRP, um, in, like I said earlier, in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Big push for that. What's nice about these hedgerows is you're creating this disturb, undisturbed environment for these soil dwelling animals like brown beetles and other predators to live. Um, and they can escape disturbance and harm in the crop field when it's being managed for crops, but also they're known to move out of these habitats when pests are present, right? And so what's good about this is you may have small narrow areas where you can't necessarily build a meadow or you know, the concept of building habitat might be in your mind to build out. You can build up and you can create that structural diversity, that laying of different plant, layering of different plants from herbaceous to shrub layer to canopy layer. And you're creating a lot of niche habitat niches vertically. So if you have a small area along the farm lane or in your field borders, you can do a lot with that. Similar to that concept, providing these undisturbed areas of perennial vegetation is beetle banks. This is a practice that is um, used much more frequently and people are more familiar with in Europe. But the same concept applies. It's just these areas of permanent vegetation where ground beetles and other soil dwelling insects can escape activity um, or disturbance in the farm field. So harvesting crops, if you are doing tillage, 
these provide these areas provide refuge. And if you look in this uh, picture here, it's nothing more than a simple grass strip, perennial grass strip. Uh, we recommend using bunch grasses for that planted on a berm. And what that berm does is provides a little bit um, higher, drier refuge that our um, ground dwelling insects and arthropods like spiders and ground beetles and things like that prefer. So they like that microclimate, right? That dry area. I'll show some examples of that as well. Um, oh, I should say that a lot of times these are, are um, planted within the crop rows, the same distance as the crop row. So it goes from field edge to field edge along the length of that um, crop field. If you have small fields, you could plant these around the perimeter. The reason for including them within the crop rows is so that you know these ground beetles can, it's, it's to help them disperse into the crops when pests are present, right? So, you know, they can move pretty far for their size, but if you have a very big field, they're gonna be concentrated around this habitat. So if you have large fields planting several beetle banks throughout, maybe every 200 feet or so would be ideal. If you have very small crop fields or if you have garden, you know, a vegetable garden, planting something around the perimeter should suffice um, because those beetles will, they have less um, territory to travel, right? To get to all the different um, areas of that field. Um, here's some beetle banks that were installed at Hawthorne Valley Farm in New York. They did several different, and you can um, check out the link down here. Um, to see a report they did on these. So what they were looking at was um, different types of beetle banks. So do we need to plant all grass, um, which is kind of the classic beetle bank. Here they used um, potted plants, transplants, uh, to get quicker establishment. You can plant these by seed as well, although those perennial grasses take a little longer to establish by seed. You can see they have some irrigation lines on here to irrigate those plants, right, until they establish. Once established, you can take the irrigation off. It's not something that you need to irrigate um, permanently, at least in the Northeast. Um, so here they did several different kinds, some with all grass, some of them they interspersed some wildflowers to give it a little uh, boost of pollinator value. And this is what it looks like mature, right, again. There's another crop field on the other side of the picture that's cut out. But you can see how these areas of vegetation provide that refuge for not only ground beetles and spiders and predatory um, insects and arthropods and soil insects, but also they have a little flowering benefit here um, for pollinators. So if your crops require um, pollination by insects, this is a great way to increase the benefit and, and get, um, you know, multiple benefits out of one conservation planting. In New Jersey, um, where I'm stationed, I do cover the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast, um, and I don't know about every state, so you'll have to check, but in New Jersey, we provide technical assistance for urban farms and community gardens as well through NRCS. And this is mainly doing things like soil testing, testing for heavy metals and contaminants in those urban areas, um, looking at the soil, looking for um, artifacts, a lot of the urban lots that are being transformed into urban gardens. You know, it's very hard to plant into the ground. A lot of those farms used raised beds because under the soil, um, there's structures like old foundations or concrete or other impervious surfaces where it's not ideal for growing plants. There's not a lot of topsoil, but you can get help in assessing what those soils are. And I know in New Jersey, we cover our soil scientists, I shouldn't say me, our soil scientists help in New Jersey and also areas of New York City. Um, and this again helps if you are able to plant into the ground and you want to know, are there contaminants in your soil um, that would make, you know, that would impact the health of, of the crops and the edibility of those crops, you, know, you want to know that ahead of time. 
So if you are an urban gardener or an urban farmer or a community gardener, look at these resources, contact your local field office and see if they provide these services. Um, I think it's a really great way to uh, look at our soils in, in a way that's a little bit more difficult. Um, if you use some of our apps like Web Soil Survey to zoom in on a very small plot of land and get a, um, a, a soil report of different attributes and soil types and all those metrics, is, is difficult on that small scale. So this is uh, this helps compensate for that um, inability to look at that those reports on, on smaller areas. There's so many more practices I didn't talk about to, um, here today that can be applied, um, you know, through NRCS technical assistance and or financial assistance that are beneficial to you know, soil health um, and vertebrates are, are packaged in with that. Pest management, you know, in implementing practices that help reduce or eliminate um, pesticides, and especially those that are toxic to pollinators and soil organisms and other beneficial insects. Forest stand improvement, tree shrub planting, the same concept like the hedgerow I showed um, earlier along the farm lane. Wind breaks and shelter belts, you know, a uh, wind break can uh, make the growing conditions for crops more favorable, right? And it can also be a source of habitat for beneficial insects. Alley cropping, prescribed burning, prescribed grazing, forage harvest management, um, restoration of rare and declining habitats, and so on. So with that, I'd like to wrap up. I will take uh, um, questions at the end if there are any that have um, you know, to do with what I presented here, this content and material related to NRCS. If you're uncomfortable asking questions that way, um, you can certainly email me. What I'll likely do if it's something about programs and practices that NRCS should be answering, um, not because I can't, but that's their area of expertise and I don't wanna misspeak. I'm, I would point you in the direction of someone that can help, um, but please do get a hold of me if you have questions. I'm happy to communicate with you and help you find somebody.